Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the University of Ottawa with the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. For a long time now, I've been telling people that we're undergoing abrupt climate change, and also that because we're undergoing abrupt climate change, the system is starting to respond much faster than people can deal with it, and we need to declare a global climate change emergency. Some people say that I'm being very alarmist to talk uh, in this fashion, but I don't think I'm being alarmist in any way. What I am doing is I'm describing the alarming behavior of our climate system and how it, the rate of change of everything that is happening is going exponential in many, many cases. And the situation is, is getting, it's starting to get out of our control. Um, basically, it causes enormous geopolitical problems. There's enormous stresses on the global food supply, on the global water supply, on infrastructure. A lot of people talk about sort of a big collapse, and that could happen. Um, in fact, it will happen if we continue business as usual, but I think a more likely scenario before we have this big collapse would be sort of death by a thousand cuts. So we have a certain resilience in our systems, in our society, and what's happening is it's being chipped away at from all corners, from all edges. And eventually there's enough chipping away, it decreases the resilience of the whole system and then that can lead to a collapse. So we're seeing, um, or not necessarily a collapse, but a continuation of like death by a thousand cuts, if you like. So I'm gonna talk about the different aspects that make it an, an emergency. So this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. Um, all these videos and the work for this website and stuff is self-funded by myself and by some very generous donors. So please consider donating uh, so that I can get out more videos so that I, continue, I can continue this work um, at the level I'm, I'm doing it at. Um, if you go down, um, if you scroll down a bunch of, uh, to a bunch of different blogs, uh, th there was an incident with the Washington Post about jet streams crossing the equator. This is my response here. So if you go down to there, I talked about why I think we're in a global climate emergency. So my view on the enormous risk that humanity faces from abrupt climate change necessitates the declaration of a global climate emergency. And this is based on over seven years of intensive work that I've done on the overall climate system, basically what we're seeing today, what happened in the past from the paleo record, and some examples of almost unbelievable degradation on our planet today include, now I can provide peer-reviewed scientific evidence on each of these things, but I'm gonna go into them now in more detail. So what we have here, so first of all, like there's no particular order, necess order necessarily to this, but these are some of the key points. The ocean acidity has increased over 30% in the last few decades. So what does this mean? We measure the, the ocean acidity by the pH. And if the pH is seven, it's neutral. The open ocean a few decades ago, say 30 years ago, was 8.20 was the pH and at the surface. And now when we measure pH at the surface on a global basis, there's different ways of doing it. Um, we get a pH of about 8.1. Uh, a few years ago, people thought it was 8.05. Uh, but 8.1 is more realistic number. And so a drop of 8.2 to 8.1 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, the pH is a logarithmic scale. So therefore it is, you know, 8.2 to 8.1 is a 30% increase in acidity. The lower the pH number, the higher the acidity. Why is this a problem? This is a problem because the base of the food chain, the phytoplankton, there's different species of phytoplankton. There's diatoms whose, sh whose 
backbone shells are based on silica or glass, but there's coccolithopores and other phytoplankton whose backbone is based on calcium. And when the ocean is too acidic, the calcium shells, the backbone cannot form, or the backbone of existing phytoplankton gets dissolved. It's not just the phytoplankton, but it's things like clams and lobsters, anything with anything with um, calcium in the backbone um, is threatened uh, by increasing ocean acidity. So the, the, um, if we lose large chunk of the phytoplankton, the coccolithophores, then this threatens the entire marine food chain. This therefore threatens human food supply, for example. Um, it threatens the entire marine food web. It threatens the high acidity of the water, breaks apart coral reefs, for example. Um, this is a huge problem. Um, this is an enormous problem, and people do not talk about the oceans enough, but the oceans, the, the oceans are in great peril from ocean acidification. The only way to reduce the ocean acidification is to remove, reduce the CO2 levels in the atmosphere and or the ocean because it, it's a dynamic balance. So if you reduce CO2 levels in the atmosphere, then, then there will be less going into the oceans. So the oceans will lose CO2 out to the atmosphere and become less acidic. If you remove the CO2 from the seawater, which may be easier to do than removing it from the atmosphere, then more CO2 will go from the atmosphere into the oceans, reducing CO2 levels. Okay, so this is a huge problem. Another one, oxygen levels in the ocean are declining six times faster than oceanographers expected. Oceanographers have been a bit lazy and they basically, they know how things change with depth over a long period of time. So for the last 50 years or so, when, they, when they're when they calculating oxygen levels, they're looking at how things are changing with depth, how much is at the surface, and how things change with depth. And they haven't been properly calculating things based on the Arrhenius equation and other equ standard equations in, in chemistry that would indicate the solubility of oxygen versus temperature. So the, the oceans are warming up and therefore they're not able to dissolve as much gas. It's interesting because warmer oceans can absorb solids more easily, such as salt, for example, the saturation levels go up, but gases, it's the opposite. So the oxygen levels are actually declining much faster than the oceanographers expected. So in, in the fall, there's a, a meeting with the Royal Society in the UK on this very topic. There's a very good discussion of this, oxygen levels in the ocean, in, on Radio Ecoshock. Um, Alex Smith interviewed some oceanographers on this topic. Okay, global ocean circulation patterns are being disrupted. Okay. Uh, we know this is happening. There's a persistent pool of anomalously cold water south of Greenland that's disrupting flow of the Gulf Stream. There's been very warm and persistent pool of water in the northern Pacific Ocean off the west coast of North America. So the ocean patterns, the ocean currents are reconfiguring on our planet. This is an enormous change. And one thing that's happened with this cold pool south of Greenland thought to be due to meltwater or the Gulf Stream used to go through that region and now it doesn't, it goes underneath so the water's colder there, is that the Gulf Stream slowing down is then pushing more water onto the continental shelves off the eastern coast of the U.S., raising sea levels. So sea levels are rising faster off the U.S. northeast um, faster than just about any other place, well, faster than most places around the world. And in fact, from 2010 to 2011, it looked like the Gulf Stream Act almost shut off and that water piled up along the coast and there was a sea level rise of 125 millimeters in the space of a year or so, and then that tapered off. So we're seeing also extremely warm waters off the east coast of the US. So we've disrupted 
the atmospheric patterns, the jet streams. We've also, we've also disrupted the ocean circulation patterns. Okay, CO2 levels. CO2 levels in June 2016 are higher than those in June 2015 by about 4 ppm. This is a startling ramping up of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. Supposedly, anthropogenic or human-caused emissions have been leveling off in 2015 and also in 2014. Yet CO2 levels are rising. Um, in 2015, uh, the rise was just, just over three parts per million. In the historical record, typical rises were about one, uh, you know, since the Industrial Revolution or, or this century, this last century. Um, and then it went up to two, two and a half, and now we've seen three. And this year, it looks like it could be four. And if you take the July numbers, July 2016 to July 2015, that number rises about five ppm. So atmospheric greenhouse gases are rapidly rising. So this, mean, this is very, very bad news if the International Energy Agency numbers saying that human emissions of CO2 have leveled off. Because if they've in fact leveled off, then these huge rises are from declining sinks, like dying forests, uh, losing Amazon rainforest, Indonesian peat fires, which are putting lots of CO2 into the atmosphere, additional emissions from the permafrost in the, in the north. So this is very bad news if, if the, I, it's very bad news anyway, but if the, I, if the numbers that claim that human emissions of CO2 have leveled off, this is even worse news. Uh, methane is over 1850 parts per billion and rapidly climbing, especially in the Arctic. So emissions, we're seeing emissions from the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. The Russians are measuring this, large increases. We've seen Siberian craters. So, so methane clathrates have been building up the pressure under the ground, ejecting a lot of soil, creating a large crater. We, we measure high concentrations of methane. We're seeing this, we haven't seen this in Alaska yet, but we're seeing lots of these appear, especially on the Yamal Peninsula where it's extremely warm. Um, also, permafrost ringing the Arctic is increased. So this is, yeah, so permafrost both on land and, and on, in marine sediments. Um, recently, there was an article about how the ground, people were walking on the ground and it was like a sponge. It was like a sponge mat. And it was, it, it's, uh, when it was punctured, then, then the methane levels were extremely high coming out of that. So we're seeing lots of phenomena that are, that are occurring because of the extremely rapid warming in the Arctic and it's affecting, uh, it's increasing methane levels coming out. Global temperatures continue to spike up and exceeded the Paris 1.5 degrees Celsius target for an entire month this year. Okay, so the temperatures, if you do plots of the temperatures of other years over time, and then you do 2016, we're way up here. We're way off the charts. You know, we approached, we, we, we surpassed 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, for an entire month. For a few days, we surpassed two degrees Celsius. So the 1.5 and the two degree numbers from Paris are, are really fantasy. Okay, there, I don't see any possible way that those numbers can make any sense um, with the lags that are built into the system. Remember, the worst effects of the gases that we put in the atmosphere are not being realized because there's a big lag in the Earth's system. So we've got these things to look forward to over the ne next decade, even with, if we completely slashed fossil fuel emissions now. The global bi biodiversity has decreased by 50%. If you look at biodiversity numbers, uh, where, you know, out projections to 2100 or even to 2070, 2050, we're talking about a loss of 40 or 50% of all species. Um, so this is not just climate change, this is also monocultures, monoculture, agriculture, um, the way it, it, you have to look at the whole ecology, you have to look at the whole food chain, and if we lose key species, then it, it ripples through the food chain. 